All right, this is Senate Government Operations. It is, I believe, um, Wednesday, March uh, 24th. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Collimore. Yes, um, the days all kind of flow together when we're doing this on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> we, today, um, and I apologize for the tardiness of our start, we just <laughs> got off the floor and we're actually waiting for two, two more of our members to join us. But um, today what we um, asked for is, as you know, in S-124, which I believe is act something or other, but I never, I can't ever get acts straight. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the reports that we asked for were, there's a whole series of reports that we asked for, but a couple of those reports were specifically the responsibility of the council to do. And one was on the use of military equipment, some kind of a, um, a standard for that. One was on um, a policy on the use of body cams. And there, was, uh, there were quite a number of questions around the body cams. And part of it was the storage and the accessibility and redaction. And so <clears throat> it's much more complicated than just getting body cams. And then the other one was on the uh, what we what we should be looking for, and this is a this is not so much a policy, but just kind of a advice to local um, agencies and sheriff's offices and other any other law enforcement agencies around what what should we be really looking for when we're looking for law enforcement officers, and then. In addition to that, are there other things that we need to look at when we're looking for supervisory roles? <clears throat> so those are the three that we asked you to come talk to us today about. And although I didn't say this when sending out the invitation, if there are in, in any of these, if there are legislative solutions that need to happen or anything that needs to be put in legislation, if you would, Tell us what those are also, um, so that we can get those get those in some place. Does that make sense? It does. Yep. Great. So <clears throat> then um, I realize we're kind of late today. So just do as much as you can and um, we'll have another time and take up other reports also. So. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. For the record, uh, Bill Sheets, I am the Interim Executive Director of the Vermont Criminal Justice uh, Council slash Vermont Police Academy for another two and a half weeks before uh, Heather Simon officially takes uh, takes the role here. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I know I've been in uh, several times. Uh, I'll take the easiest one first. The easiest one first is actually uh, a responsibility, at least first blush, of the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. So that is the entrance requirement and the guidelines for hiring and supervisory promotions within organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this position that I'm in sits on the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. I do know that that is on their agenda and they have a draft copy uh, ready for dissemination at their meeting on Monday the 29th. So I think that's actually nearing uh, a completion or at least a fairly revised and well-refined rough draft for their review. And how are, how are they doing it? Are they doing it as kind of a, a guidance for local law enforcement uh, to use when they're hiring and, um, super, and promoting? Yeah, I think uh, a best practices guide for all of the above related to entrance uh, personnel that are just coming into the organization as well as promotional uh, opportunities throughout a career. Mm -hmm. Well, that was an easy report. That's my, <laughs> easiest, that's my easiest one. I would love to tell you that uh, the rest are, are done and complete. Uh, here's what I can say. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work with an Act 56 and 124. Uh, I can speak about any of them. I do just, if, if it's okay, Madam Chair, I'd like to give an overview of kind of where the council 
<laughs> subcommittees and working groups are overall in this process, if it's okay with you. No, that's perfect. Thank you. So we've had three full council meetings and of course the new version 24 person and really we recognize that that's a bit of an unwieldy number and the, the majority of the work is happening through subcommittees and working groups. We now have 17 of those. So I think my responsibility and my goal prior to departing and Heather's arrival uh, in two and a half weeks is that we have uh, the first layer meeting for all of these committees uh, and working groups. We have them, they're all being asked right now to identify a prioritized timeline based on language in S-124 and other areas for their work. Then we intend to create a master timeline, kind of a visual walkthrough of all 17 committees, knowing the pressure, uh, the timelines, and then candidly, the balance between us running a Vermont Police Academy with a level three full-time course coming up in the very near future and juggling all of those responsibilities. So, you know, I testified before, uh, you don't get thanked enough. S-124 is really good. It's impactful. It's meaningful. We take it seriously. Uh, we continue to take it seriously. Uh, we just, in some areas, we know that things, certain things have definitive timelines. So for example, the body worn camera policy, law enforcement advisory board just barely handed us their version of that. So we barely introduced that last week at the council meeting to solicit interest from the council members. And we have created a working group uh, to identify the work that needs to be done there. The timeline on that, for example, is January 1st, uh, 2022. That sounds like a long time. There's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done uh, especially when it comes to the guidelines, the retention, the redaction, uh, things like that. So we know that that committee, that working group has to get moving and has to get moving now. He, here's, our, here's the balance, uh, again, is running the day-to-day -day operations and doing it uh, in its intended fashion, which is nothing but the best. That's our intention is to deliver the best training and create the best product with our law enforcement uh, allied agencies in Vermont. And and we are a family, as you know, uh, the vast majority of instructors here are from outside agencies uh, that come in and do subject matter expertise. So we wanna deliver that at the same time. We wanna make sure that these 17 subcommittees and working groups are, are getting the job done and meeting the requirements and timelines of this committee and the legislature. Can you tell us what the 17, do you have that at your fingertips? I do, and actually I was hoping, but again, based on pace, um, I, I have been joking and I actually got it on the record in, in the house side, so I should get it on the record here. I believe that if either Lindsay Thaverge or Cindy Taylor Patch, the two directors, if they murder me, it might be a justifiable homicide based on the pace of work right now. <laughs> so that I, I should get that on the record because my intent is, and our intent is, to not only get this information to you, and I can cover it with cover it uh, with you verbally, but is to on our website have a page dedicated to each and every subcommittee that will have a marching orders, kind of a charter, have the language specific to S124 or whatever the the uh, the driving language is, the list of subcommittee members, a, a place to warn and post and list meeting minutes and essentially keep track. So anybody in the public can actually look and determine what progress that we're making and an independent page for all of those. Uh, so the subcommittees are, subcommittees are long-term committees that we know have to exist and they're always gonna have to exist for all the right reasons. Working groups we've defined as, as they have a finite marching order with a timeline and once they're done, then we can, use those resources elsewhere. Uh, so I'll start with the working groups. Uh, so the council rules. Council rules are, are something that really do not match up any longer with our 24 person council. So we are in the process of identifying uh, through uh, our, our assigned attorney, uh, through Bill Sorrell and some other volunteers. We're beginning the work of revising our council rules. And of course, that's a uh, that's a legislative process as well, and that'll take some time, but it's much needed because it it reflects the old construct of the twelve-person council. Uh, the military equipment acquisition working group. 
So that will, they will kick off their first meeting. I know it's a topic uh, today uh, where we will uh, take a shot at the creation of a model policy related to the acquisition of military equipment. So we already have several volunteers from the council as well as from uh, chiefs, sheriffs and various associations in the state. And, and that's the neat part here. All 24 council members and or their proxies have been tasked and have readily accepted any and all challenges related to working on multiple subcommittees. And it doesn't get any better than that because that's they know the impact and they know what we're trying to accomplish. So to have them interwoven with our staff, with the larger law enforcement community, it's, it's again, it is a seamless way to get this work done and they truly understand what we're, uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the, we have the model body warned camera policy working group. We have solicited interest for facial recognition technology working group. We've been tasked, uh, again, Act 56, S124, with coming up with a uh, recommended policy. And many of these, by the way, we know have a public outreach component. So for some of these without a timeline, they may be more late summer so we can actually have an in-person kind, of kind of a hearing. So the council can kind of take some testimony as to the thoughts of the public. Wherever there's that public input piece, we, uh, we take that seriously. And I think while Zoom's a wonderful thing, I don't know that it can quite deliver the, the same impact as in person, but we'll probably try both. Uh, we have the Entrance Testing Requirements Working Group. So this is a big one. This is, a, this is a real ask to make sure that everything we're doing, both written test and psychological profile, is contemporary, that it can be delivered 24-7 uh, asynchronous to an agency uh, candidate. Uh, they can complete that. The results can go to the agency. They can go to us. Uh, this is where, candidly, uh, Madam Chair and Committee, we, we need your help. We ask again. I know that uh, Bill Sorrell did a great job the other day testifying that we've had some success on the House side. And House Appropriations did, in fact, come over with a recommendation for two positions. It's going to go to Senate and has gone to Senate Appropriations. And we certainly appreciate that recognition. And that's related to professional regulation. And, and I could talk for hours on how we're doing with that. It's... Uh, it's that committee, that's that subcommittee, by the way, currently meets one, uh, an hour and a half a week to hear professional regulation cases. It's almost, and by the way, prior to those meetings, they receive documentation that can be hundreds of pages. So it's, it's nearly a, it's a, it's a rather onerous process, but really good results. So I know I'm bouncing all over the place here, but because that is a stand that is a regular committee right that's not a working group correct yes okay yeah so there are areas like this entrance testing requirement okay. working Madam group Chair, may I ask a question yes i'm sorry senator clarkson yeah hi B bill sorry the entrance testing requirements is not a working group it's a standing group or no professional regulation is a oh professional sorry so you skipped on so i wanted to ask you a question about the entrance testing requirements Sure. Um, surely there must be some great models out there for uh, for uh, states that have already revamped their entrance entrance testing. Uh, uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel on this one, do we? I don't think so. I think we want to make sure that we do it in a fashion that represents Vermont, and I think that we uh, we in Vermont do some things better than than other areas. the The easy answer is. We need, in all likelihood, a small amount of one-time money to actually go ahead, go ahead and identify a vendor uh, and a process to solicit uh, the work uh, that needs to be done in this area. Once it's done, that should live with a vendor for them to be able to deliver a secure test, whether it's a hundred question multiple choice. Uh, but I think, Senator, you're on point. We are in the process of surveying other states and municipalities to determine if there is a mechanism with some assurances that it's meeting the criteria that's critically important to all of us, right? So uh, the, the bias piece is massive. We want to ensure that everybody has the same opportunity when they sit down and take that test, whether it's in person currently under the current construct or 
if they're doing it in front of a computer, they should have the same ability to, uh, to make it through in the same criteria. Oh, absolutely. But I, again, other states have been, so I, I would assume there was help out there. So the, it's the professional regulation committee that's the standing committee? Yes, that's one of them. And it's my fault for bouncing all over the place. Right, I, get, no, I, just, I get excited when I talk about this stuff, so. Right, okay, great. I just, okay, great. So the entrance testing we are anticipating, and, and I know this is not one of the fiscal committees, but I know we, we appreciate your long time support uh, in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, the leanest of lean budgets. What's the, what's the financial ask on that? Twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars to uh, just one time, and then we'll have an operation set up that I think will uh, greatly benefit every organization in the state of Vermont, and we'll have something that we can stand behind and be proud of that you can be proud of. That uh, that's an ask in S one twenty four, okay. and you know I, I, the testimony, and I think I can't remember if it's been in this committee or not, but uh, prior to my arrival here, it, it's been widely known, very thin budget in terms of right now the ask is 2.7 just in general funds, 10.5 uh, full-time equivalent state and 1.5 um, interdepartmental transfer just uh, grant funded. We last year ran out of money to buy a toner for the copier. And candidly, it's unacceptable when we're asked to do all of these things that we take serious. We really want to achieve everything that you're asking us to achieve. But when there's not money to buy toner, I'm not sure how we can say to a committee, we do have $50,000 to really take a look at this and implement it in the way that it should be implemented. And Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. So yes. This sort of underscores what I think you, I heard you say is that the Oh, this is the council, not the academy, right? Uh, well, that's the I, that's, that's always the say, that, that the plus of being in an agency and underneath an agency is you have all that additional, both financial support and 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 just uh, infrastructure support. But this yeah. is not this is not that. This is the council, which is going to stay independent. It's really both. That's the that's the difficulty with the discussion, right? We have a 24 person council that lives over here. We, the staff of the Vermont Police Academy, essentially work right. for and support that 24 person council. The budgetary uh, impact that I'm talking about is, in fact, the Vermont Police Academy. But it, right. it's so, it's interchangeable. So it could. So some of the the financial challenges could be uh, hmm, managed. Uh, a little more easily with a with a a big sibling agency make you know advocating and ensuring better budgets for the academy. Yeah, it's hard to have a voice of just twelve people when you have no seat at the table in the form of a commissioner or a secretary. Yes, and Sherling would be oh well, whoever is in that position, the secretary of the agency would be a, a presumably a a a much louder. A has a seat at the table and B would be a very strong advocate. It, just an advocate. And honestly, we might not have to go back to the legislature and it might be easy to find 25 or $50,000 in an 80 to $120 million budget than it is in a 2.7 million budget where 93% of it is beyond your control with salaries, benefits, fee for space and things like that. Right. And, and, and so I think what our committee and I'm sure our chair is going to ask you this, to, to just clarify all your asks this year, because I've so far heard this afternoon, $50,000 and two positions. Is that? Right, we, we will, as we go, as right. we go through, um, I mean, at, at the very end, we'll need to know what all of those are, but right now we're not really addressing the asks in particular, but where, where these working groups and committees are in terms of their what they're doing. And then as you go through, like with the entrance testing requirements, you'd need a few a small infusion of cash. So we've got we've got that. So we'll be keeping track of all of those asks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the other three remaining working groups, and again there are nine of them, uh, tactical or I'm sorry, training curriculum review working group. So we always need to be mindful that we're looking at all curriculum to make sure it's relevant, uh, it's contemporary, it's, it's 
best practices. So that's an ongoing thing, but specifically in S124, it asks us, it, it requests that we take a look uh, in a, from a number of different lenses. Uh, there is the tactical medical training working group. So that's a very small uh, working group that's looking at the delivery of uh, critical first aid in the field. So in tactical situations where somebody, so like uh, it's applicable in a situation like Boulder, Colorado, uh, the, the shooting there, right? That where you have something massive like that or any critical injury where we can either equip and respond to either officers or citizens and help them in, in critical need. Uh, then there's the uh, field training evaluation program. So the last component, once somebody graduates from here and gets a certification to become a law enforcement officer is their requirement to uh, pass a field training a program that's completed in the field. Again, that's always a program we, where we want to ensure we're doing best practices and we're taking a, a real comprehensive look at that. Uh, the last working group is a leadership and supervisory training working group. What we learned, especially in the COVID environment where some things were put on hold. I think, again, I've had the opportunity through consulting to travel throughout the US and Canada. I, I'm pleased to proudly testify that I think we do it uh, as well as anyone in the country for basic training. So the level two, the level three, where I think we can improve and we should improve are delivering training for officers that are a little more mature or leaders in the organization related to supervision, culture, things like that, that I think we can offer courses, whether it's internally or we bring those resources in. I think we uh, really should, we owe it to, to the, the agencies uh, to create a really comprehensive mature training matrix that can identify those trainings that we most critically need for the profession to get better. And then that takes us to the existing standing, existing or newly created subcommittees. Uh, fair and impartial policing. So that's been a, that's been a subcommittee for uh, a while. Uh, there are several ask. We are in the odd number year, so we have to deliver a, uh, a training. This year we prefer to do that in person. Uh, we're gonna do that related to uh, uh, getting better at perceptions at roadside and doing a better job at traffic stop data collection, as well as some other bias related trainings. Uh, so they're working on that right now. The biggest, by far the biggest committee, 23 people subcommittee is the training advisory subcommittee. Many of those working groups I named are subsets of those that include some of those members. Uh, that really is responsible for all the deliverables uh, under the guidance of Cindy Taylor Patch, the director of training. So it, it really is all encompassing. Uh, a very large ask on a continual basis to look at curriculum, the way that we're delivering training, being responsive to things like de-escalation, the use of force, and, and uh, again, uh, implementing best practices kind of across the board. Uh, the Professional Regulation Subcommittee, we've talked a little bit about that, and I could talk about that for hours. Uh, there's a waiver subcommittee. So we reinstituted the ability for somebody to come in from out of state that is an out of state police officer that can essentially give us their portfolio of their experience. We assess that portfolio and identify which specific Vermont trainings they're required to do so that they do not have to complete the entire. 800 hours level three basic training. So that uh, we're getting more requests on that. Uh, the state police has recently uh, decided that they're going to look at out-of-state waivers as well. So that should increase the scope and the responsibility of that committee, which is why we made it a, a standing subcommittee again. We have a domestic violence subcommittee. Again, they're looking at uh, deliverables for, for training. Uh, there are certain training requirements uh, semi or uh, biannually. Uh, there's a canine subcommittee, a use of force subcommittee, and a highway safety subcommittee. And Madam Chair, if it's if it's okay, I, I think if you give us a week, I believe we can have the outline of all of these and provide you written documentation. Again, description of the subcommittee, who is assigned to each subcommittee from the council maybe a, you know, a reminder of who's on the council. 
and kind of the charter and the timeline and, and, and what's happening and all of those. Cause I think that really it's complex. There's a lot of things that are happening. Um, and again, we take, we love it. We take it all seriously. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, I, I thank you. Uh, and I, I think that um, last year there, when we were looking at 124, there was some pressure for us to come up with an, all these answers. And it, it, knowing the complexity of it, it didn't make any sense to us to try to come up with the answers for these, but to instead ask the appropriate groups um, in your case, it's, for example, it's headed by the council, but it involves the ACLU and the Human Rights Commission and different groups on different issues here. So um, <clears throat> it made sense for us to ask for, and we realized that it was putting a lot of work on the council, but in the end, I think that the answers that are presented to us will be much better thought out and um, meaningful than had we tried last year to to come up with those. Senator Clarkson, did you have I thought oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Bill, I, I, these are all great subcommittees. The one that glaring missing one is mental health. I mean really I mean canines, I mean I know you have canine units, but canines, mental health is a much bigger issue for the police world than canines. We've, uh, we've talked about having it a standalone com committee. I can assure you that that is a critical part of the training advisory committee. So that could be the same for many, many of the discussions that, that we have within that subcommittee. But uh, we actually have had an open discussion about creating a separate standalone long-term subcommittee related to mental health. So I think that's impactful, Senator, from, for us hearing it from you because even though I think we're giving it the due recognition that it critically deserves, it might be better served to actually be more prominent on our website, standalone subcommittee, where we're identifying that we're, uh, we're taking that particular issue very seriously. I, I actually have some mixed feelings about that, um, just because I think that um, issues of mental health and bias should be interwoven with every single um, yeah. one of these committees. That, that if you're talking about um, professional regulation, that sh it should be part of that. If you're talking about the use of body cams, that should, it should be part of that or any other. So I, I think it's a conversation you need to have more about whether to have a special, um, uh, a, a special committee that's do devoted to mental health. Well, they, they have one devoted to impartial policing. I mean, they have that one is, devoted but to- that was it, the legislature that, that did that. And I have to tell you, I, I have, um, well, I have mixed feelings about the way we, the way we did it and the way we um, applied it and, um, <laughs> But I, I have a real problem with model policies in general. I, I think that um, a, a model policy that's defined, and that's why I, I'm hoping that when you are talking about things like the use of body cams and facial recognition and stuff that what you're looking at is um, what should be in a policy, the things that people need to put into a policy. And I know that on the FIP pol um, policies, there were some real issues and we reviewed them all. And um, there's things like in the, in the po model policy that says uh, you have to be, you have to treat all community members in the same way. That should be part of the overall policy of the police department. That shouldn't be just in a fair and impartial policing policy or just in a mental health policy. It should be the overall, but if, but if when we were looking at the policies, if they didn't have it in their fair and impartial policing policy as such, 
but had it in their general policies, then it wasn't accepted as a, um, as a, a legitimate policy. So I, I think that we need to be, uh, we need to tell people what they need to address in a policy, but to actually tell them that this is their policy is both um, in my mind, doesn't make any sense. And it also, I, I, all the department has to do is to say, we're just gonna accept the policy that was given to us. They don't have to discuss it. They don't have to grapple with it. They don't have to say, what does this really mean? They just have to accept the model policy. And that doesn't do anything in terms of their education. But I'll stop about that because I, um, I, I just feel so strongly that when we do model policies, we're doing a real disservice to people instead of telling them, these are the 27 things you have to address in your policy. But anyway, so that's my little speech for the day. <laughs> there are yes, Senator Colomar. Than that, that I need off out of committee help on. I mean, I get I get some of what you're getting at, but I'd love we we can chat about it at another point. But I the difference between a policy and a model policy and 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 giving them a charge. It's anyway, it's well, well just look, I'll go just you was one example that has nothing to do with law enforcement here. Um, at one point we were looking at a model policy for uh, school lunch programs. And the agency of education at the time it was the department but came up with this model policy about what the school lunch program should look like. And so it didn't require anything on the part of this individual school. They didn't have to sit down and say, what is our community like? What kinds of foods are available to us? What can we buy locally? What is the best kind of food for us to prepare for our students? Um, do we have um, ethnic um, choices here that we need to be uh, sensitive to? I, I mean, it didn't, all they had to do is just accept the policy. They didn't have to have any conversations at all. About, you want them to own it by making I want them, I want people when they have a policy, I want them to sit down and say, these are the 27 things we have to address. How are we going to address this in our policy? Okay. That, that's all, I, I just, I want them to own it instead of just right. accepting something that we tell them to, which is exactly what happened with fair and impartial policing. So, so Senator Colomore, right. huh? I hear you saying that you want them to own it and and yeah. and incorporate it in in whatever fashion is it works for them. Yeah, Senator Colomore. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Bill, I didn't hear anything, but maybe I was dozing here, but I really I was. Um, school resource officers, how do they um, figure into this in terms of? How do they get trained now and where are they going to fit in? Yeah, Senator, it's uh, so that's not, uh, not necessarily under the purview of the council or the academy. Once you complete basic training and you're in good standing in your organization, your respective organization, if they have a school resource officer program, can then solicit interest and select. They would obtain the training. We could host a training, but essentially that is the responsibility of that host agency to uh, to do that. Where we have in the past here, uh, under our umbrella, hosted subject matter experts related to school resource officers. Uh, the content largely is controlled by outside expertise. So at, at the discretion of the level of training is at the discretion of that individual agency. So it falls to each local agency basically to train their own people or find them? Yeah, there's very few now that still are in the school resource officer business. It's, uh, it's definitely uh, diminishing. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, if I, if I may just uh, touch base on the, the policy question quickly. Yep, please. So in large part, we do very little policy work. That's the responsibility of the respective organizations. They have comprehensive policy and procedures. 
where I think we find ourselves getting involved is when the organizations perhaps don't do as they're supposed to. And there's a legislative mandate that says, hey, you know what, perhaps you're not getting it right in fair and impartial policing. So we're going to ask the Law Enforcement Advisory Board and the Criminal Justice Council, and appropriately so, to come up with some model policy language. That's where we do a dive mm -hmm. into creating policy. But generally, that's the responsibility of the, the organization. Our charter is much, much more broad in terms of the delivery of training. So as it relates to, to mental health, for example, we're gonna concentrate far more on an interwoven approach to deliver throughout our curriculum every chance we can inject de-escalation, for example, better communication skills, better outreach. Uh, we're going to do that. So it's all interwoven. So we're not heavily policy driven in these working groups and subcommittees unless and until we get those marching orders from the Senate and then we're gonna take it seriously and we're gonna do it. But generally it falls to the organization. Yeah. And that's that's how we did the fair and impartial policy and 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 swept into that the um immigration policy, which I still think was a mistake because but to have them be in the same policy. But anyway, um any more questions or anything? Comments? No, it, it, do you have a total of a, a bill? How many people are now engaged in all this work? I mean, you have all these subcommittees. It's not just the 24 council members. I assume you have members from all over the place on these. How many people are engaged in all this work? Uh, dozens, likely over a hundred, but don't quote me on that for a week. You can quote me in a week when I send you a document that has all of that. Oh, I can tell you right now, I have a list of the reports that we requested. There are 10 of them, 10 reports. And each of them, like the law enforcement hiring qualifications was the responsibility of the council, but they were to work with uh, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, the relevant um, social and racial equity groups, um, mental health agencies, people with mental uh, who had themselves had mental health issues. So there's tons of people involved in in these um, reports. I I believe I I would say well over a hundred. All right, so um, I realize that we don't have any specifics, but um, if you, we'll give you another week or so, another, how about we give you a week and a half? Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> and um, primarily because I've been trying to do next week's schedule, <laughs> it's already filling up, but, um, so, and then at that point, what I would also ask when you do the do them, if there are, if there's legislative uh, changes that need to happen in order to to um, make any of the changes that your your reports are suggesting, that you bring those to us also so that we can get get those. Um, I I and I don't know what what they might be. But um, I mean, just something as simple as uh, um, how to go from level two to level three without having to repeat the whole thing. Um, I, that, if, if there's an answer for that, um, it might need a legislative change somewhere. Um, or I don't think we need to change the kinds of training that you do, except what would be interesting is if you would bring us also a list of the kinds of training that we have mandated over the last uh, five or six years that without regard to reducing any, any training, um, because we've mandated a number of hours um, in different areas. And I'd be curious what those, those were. We can certainly put that together. 
is there anything else committee that we should be looking for? That's a lot. Yeah, I think they're working pretty hard. Huh? I think they're working pretty hard. I I, I think so too. And and it's um I know that this is work that doesn't get a lot of um press or a lot of it isn't doesn't seem very glitzy and it doesn't ever move fast enough for most people. But I think that um it it is it is happening and I think that we should we should acknowledge that. So anybody else? As, as much as you didn't like the fair and impartial policing work, it actually has enabled a huge amount of our moving with data into our whole racial equity discussion. I mean, it really oh. was so essential for uh, the work that followed. So. No, I didn't say I didn't like, didn't well, like. I know you didn't like work. the way it was done. I didn't like the I didn't like the way that the legislature came up with a policy and right. said this is this is the policy that you're going to have. I didn't I thought that didn't um, make any sense to me, but that's my bias about policies. And it's not an implicit bias. It's very explicit. <laughs> and I was gonna say all of your biases are pretty explicit. Uh, not not all of them. I keep oh. discovering ones that I didn't know about. Your your committee mates are pretty clear on them. Oh, on my explicit ones, but I keep discovering New every day. <laughs> um, uh, really, uh, I do. I'm trying to get Brian to smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right, committee. Is there anything else? Thank you, Bill, for um, meeting with us, and we look forward to. Um, um the reports um i think this is this is really important work and um so the other well maybe i don't know if you have answers to this there was an article in our paper not too long ago that said vermont is the most policed state in the country and i've heard the opposite and it said that the number of traffic stops have increased. I don't know what the percentage was. And I wonder if there's any reason if we know why those, maybe that's more a question for Mike Sherling um, about why, what the kinds of stops are, if they're mostly drug related, if they're speeding related, but why we have is that how it's measured just on traffic stops that's ridiculous well it that that is the measure that these they were this article was using as they said that um um we have more stops than we've ever had before <coughs> and i do know that we have a lot of stops down here um and it said it quoted Bennington as being really high, and I think Wyndham as being really high. And um, one of the problems is we have 91 right here, and Bennington has Route 9 and 7. And I mean, the other day there was a guy driving about 110 miles an hour in an unregistered car with bad license plates or something. And he had, I don't know how many bags of heroin in the car. So I don't know if we have more stops because we have more drug trafficking or or what. But we'll ask Mike Sherling that, I guess. Probably better than you. Uh, certainly not in my purview, uh, for sure. I, I will gladly defer to the commissioner on that one. So if we have a full class, if we have a full class starting soon, how many is that? 40? Uh, no. So in a COVID environment, we were restricted because of um, a whole bunch of COVID concerns to 28. We do believe that we can move from that number because at this point, we feel confident that while we cannot enforce vaccinations on anyone because they're emergency use authorization, we believe that most recruits will enter our academy fully vaccinated 
to include staff and support personnel. We believe we can fully accommodate everybody on the list and wait list, and that varies often greatly. Uh, but sadly, including wait list right now is 35 or 36 people. And they have to pass the, the physical fitness test, the entrance uh, that happens. And if they're successful in doing that, uh, they will enter here, uh, usually a max of 38 comfortably because of scenarios on May 3rd. The state police three week pre-basic starts three weeks before that. And then it's 16 weeks. And then they have what's called a post-basic for another four weeks. So we do that twice a year. It's 23 weeks twice a year. So just the level three, that's what our small staff is working with almost full time, 46 weeks out of the year. Then you have to do the level twos and deliver all of the other training deliverables as well. So that's one of the reasons why you need to look at um, less residential training perhaps and more um, in the field um, or regional um, non-overnight training, and that might accommodate some people who aren't on the waiting list because, um, as was brought up to us with by the mayor of Winooski when she talked to us, that she had, and she just had one person, she said, but who is a, a single mom with a kid and could not possibly go for 16 weeks of overnight training, but would have made a great police officer. Yeah, and that's certainly one of the areas that we're taking seriously, and we'll take a, a comprehensive look at that uh, through the work of the subcommittees and working groups. Good, good. But uh, but the, the easy answer on that is, unfortunately, I think it's more of a difficulty in recruiting in this current environment uh, for agencies sending candidates to us for entrance, because honestly, if the wait list was more, we would likely be able to accommodate many more. Uh, so... For those that are going to fail the physical fitness requirements, we're probably going to be under 30, and we would like to be at 38. Well, I'll make my other speech for the day. Think about it. Why would, why would anybody want to become a law enforcement officer in this environment? I mean, we've, we've done our best to, to um, uh, demonize them I, I think I, I think it's full of opportunities and I think that people who care about their communities and public safety and public health might actually be inspired by what's going on and wanting to really engage with it now I, I think there's a whole new reason for uh what maybe wanting to join I, I agree with you it's tough the certainly the, the the pay needs to be brought up I mean the pay is a big issue and the only really well-paid team are the, are the bigger towns and the Vermont State Police. So I think pay is a big issue, but I think actually there, we need, and that's a question for Bill later, is how are we, how are we recruiting? How, what kind of exciting, I mean, I know you don't have the money to get a great recruiter, you know, marketing and, and all that stuff, but, you know, I think actually in this environment with the right angle, there are huge communities to recruit from right now. I mean, if, I think our our BIPOC community is a would be a great community to be engaging with to to recruit as officers. I mean, this is a it it's a rich opportunity uh, for uh, people who want to engage and be involved in leadership in their community. Yeah, I I do agree with you that we need to expand our recruiting, and um, uh, I was very excited to see that um, uh, Omar Buell became a, um, he was um, one of the ones that was at our uh, Democratic Caucus two years ago and talked to us about wanting, um, he's a, a Somalian refugee, I believe. And, um, but, on, and that's good and we need to, to do that. I have had two law enforcement people who are really good people um, and they have, just told their their kids over my dead body will you become a cop because because of the current environment so we need to we need to find a balance there it's um i think it's anyway 
anybody else need to make a, a speech of the day? <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm all set. I, I this and town meeting are two topics that I can't ever help but expounding on. I happen to agree with you, Madam Chair. I, I I'm sensitive to uh, Senator Clarkson's point, but I think if you ask the average law enforcement person now, um, and money's an issue, I, I won't deny that, but so is respect. And I don't know that they're getting the kind of respect they might have had 20 or 25 years ago. I think we have allowed, uh, you know, things to happen that are, are bad. And um, it, to me, I bet if you made a list of the top 10 occupations, the, I, I don't think law enforcement even make the top 10. I think it's uh, it's too bad. So. And that's why we need to we need to continue to change the culture here. I think that right. Vermont does have have um, a better culture among law enforcement than and that's it's not perfect. It's not perfect. And we um, need to change where it isn't perfect. We need to change it, but we need to continue that cultural change within the within law enforcement so that um, we do have um, yes, yeah, Senator Rom. Well, I just wanted to say, I mean, one thing a lot of states have started to track is how expensive misconduct is. I feel like we can easily get stuck in right or wrong, but a lot of states are, are starting to show that their local municipalities might spend 6% of their budget on, you know, these cases and the, the problems. I mean, this has been very expensive for Vermont. Rutland, White River Junction, those have been huge burdens on taxpayers. So, you know, it's not just do we like police or not, but this is a, a profession that will continue to be heavily regulated because it's life or death, civil liberty or not for people. And it gets extremely expensive to have misconduct on your books mm -hmm. and a culture that's not accountable. But mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about recruiting in the BIPOC community now? I mean, don't you think that's an opportunity that we could... And I would argue but some of those cases were cases where black officers felt forced out because of the culture. I know, you but know? We're, we're working actively to try and change the culture. And, but and if they see those ask, major headlines, I'm just, you asked me a question yeah. and I'm giving you my answer, which is if they see a culture that doesn't evolve with their presence, then no, they're not going to stay. And I think Omar Boulay is a great you know, example of a pioneer and someone who really, we, we know that it's hard with the, with certain tests that for new American yeah. folks to participate. I, I want good police officers, <laughs> no. yeah. but, but that means the culture has to accept these changes. Otherwise it's expensive when someone leaves yeah. and sues a department for creating an unsafe environment for them. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. But we're in committed to change. I mean, I think I don't think that's the anyway. Yeah. Well, we are, and um, I think most of our law enforcement leaders are, and so oh. it. Um, we just need to make sure that we uh, give the support that's needed to continue that yes. cultural change and to oh. and to make sure that those people who are are not changing with with the change in culture are somehow um, disciplined or as uh, we used to say in um, in the 60s I'm going to send you back for regrooving um, <laughs> so we, we need to make sure that um, the people get the message that that it is changing and that we continue to support that however we need to do that that's why i suggested that if there are any legislative changes that need to be made here that we, we need to be aware of those